As usual, uh, we have brethren like Michael and a bunch of the rest of you that steal a lot of my jokes and then try to turn them around on me. Uh, but, you know, when you look out at, at a bunch of people who are probably, I don't know, I hesitate to even say one-eighth of a wit, and it definitely is not, uh, you know, a full wit, not with any one of you. We'd have to put at least two of you together to equal the one. But anyway, uh, you guys... Uh, you guys, for some reason, like, like to borrow some of my stuff, I've noticed, and then you turn around and try to make out that it's not much good. I hope you have a, I hope you have a, I hope you have a picture uh, of this. I, uh, I started to do it in color, but you just have a black and white. But I wanted you to really have this at least, uh, and you'll basically, of course, see why as we go through uh, the material. But... Uh, some of you, you probably, some of you preachers especially, will have to have help with your kid, with your kids helping you to color it in. So we just did it in black and white to kind of help you out. Or, or with your grandkids, uh, or in uh, Jerry Brewer's situation, great, great, great grandkids. <laughs> so he's old, I'm telling you. So uh, at, at one point in 2004, uh, we needed to sell, Vicki and I did, the uh, little uh, 27 little pygmy goats in order to move back to Texas from Florida. And I said in the manuscript there, okay, I admit it, Vicki and I were so attached to these cute little warm-blooded creatures that this was emotionally, emotionally disturbing to us. And as my wife will tell you, I would even provide warmth by way of heaters and stuff for them during those snow-covered, frigid blizzards so common here in the Sunshine State. This was in Winter Haven, by the way, <laughs> Central Florida. Uh, the ones under a year old were especially adorable, and we searched for a buyer for all 27 who would not kill them, would not kill them. Uh, and I said, no kidding, pun intended. Uh, we particularly did not want to sell them to any person that was desirous uh, to slit their throat and eat them in a religious rite uh, or ritual. Maybe this will give you the idea here of what we're talking about. H have you ever been there and watched it? And some of us have, I certainly have. And full grown goats, uh, and some of the not pygmy variety, which we thought or I think are much more docile and easier to get along with many times than other goats that I've had in the past that were much larger. But you haven't lived until you've seen someone else do it or done it yourself to actually take uh, some sort of a sharp, very sharp blade and to put it there at the throat and, and think about what does a, a little goat do? What does a little, like a lamb here that you're holding there in the little uh, photograph, what do they do? Yeah, they might, and many times though, I've heard nothing out of them, which you see where we're going, of course, uh, with that reference to Christ. And that as a lamb for its shears is, is uh, dumb or silent, mute in effect, and many times it's that way. I've seen a friend of mine, one of the more recent times, named uh, Jim Thornhill, and he had uh, different animals, and he just took the couple of men had driven in, they wanted, you know, this animal, and he just got the animal and brought, uh, I believe it was a female, out. And then he just got his blade out, really, really sharp. You know, he keeps it very sharp, uh, which is obviously the way really it should be, so it's over with in a quick way. But it, it is somewhat gruesome. That's what I'm wanting you to see here and to think about. And then to just think about the Old Testament and the situation, especially of animal sacrifices. But of course, we mentioned in the manuscript and deal also, you know, with uh, plants and so forth. But uh, we particularly did not want to uh, sell them to someone who would do this, who would slit their, their throats. And I mean, after all, we had pretty well all of them named by this time, just like you would a dog or a cat. And if they'd had a chance, some of them would. They'd come right up to you, get, get up, jump up on you, and so forth. One of the things I used to do was just even get down 
you know, uh, on all fours, you know, usually begging Vicky to let me back in the house. And, and the goat would jump up on my back this way and, and would just, you know, frolic and have a big time up there and so forth, and then jump off. You know, it's like king of the mountain, and I was the mountain, apparently. Uh, but you get attached to them is the point here. And, and I said, yes, we were practicing religious profiling and looking over uh, prospective purchasers. Uh, and some you could just really profile a little bit and figure what they're going to do with them. Uh, and since God made both uh, us, you know, he made us and, it's, it's, and he made the animals and so forth, it's clear uh, that God is acutely aware of these, and I'll just say instinctive or almost instinctive feelings that we humans possess, especially toward mammals of the kind that I've mentioned as demonstrated uh, as Nathan set up David, you'll remember. If you look at uh, 2 Samuel 12, uh, verses 1 through 6, you're familiar uh, with this, and yet uh, God uses it, I would say, in a, in a certain way here, uh, to get, you know, a message uh, across. We won't take time to read the whole thing, but we know, you know what happened there. And that, you know, the poor man in verse 3, uh, this rich guy in verse 2 had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man in verse 3 had nothing except one little, you, one little, notice it's little, little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, like the one you have the photograph uh, that we handed out. Uh, and it grew up together with him and with his children. Uh, it ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. This was a pet. There is no doubt he's attached here, see. And a traveler, this is Nathan, as a prophet of God using this, though. Think about it. And a traveler came, verse 4, to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the little poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And notice verse 5, though. Notice verse 5. And I know you have this in you whether you want to admit it uh, or not. Uh, so David's anger, when he hears this story from Nathan, uh, the prophet here, uh, and the Lord, remember back in verse 1, sent Nathan with this information and to use it here with King David uh, and to approach him about his sin. It says in verse 5, So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, as the Lord lives, the man, he's like an oath here, the man who has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And of course you remember Nathan then looks at David, and apparently very calmly said, Thou art the man. You're the man. He's got him caught in an emotional vice here, you see, and no way to get out of it, and yet it, he escalates it in the sense of taking it from this, these mere, uh, a mere animal here, a little lamb, uh, uh, this man had in his bosom and treated as a pet and, and the growing up with his children and so forth. So what's happening here? The prophet Nathan then is using the normal and proper feelings of affection and concern the, this, uh, for these non-human creatures to show King David his sinful condition. Uh, and by, by means of, particularly, as we said, of a little pet lamb. While other verses allow the eating of sheep, we know that, uh, for food or goats and so forth, uh, including religious services in which even our Lord, I mentioned some scriptures there that he participated. Uh, the Lord taught just by his actions, much less what he said, that animals are not equal like PETA, people for the ethical treatment of animals tell us. They're not equal. We're not equal species. We are here and animals are down here. But that still won't stop you from having the feelings that David had here uh, towards uh, animals, and God used it for his own purposes here, and I, I wanted to use it in, in coming into this lesson. And so again, this lesson, or this incident, uh, draws off of a common, normal interest in love, which uh, the followers of God can have towards all creatures, uh, great or small, in choosing to make some of them uh, our pets. Now, most of us can handle, I can handle it, can't you? I can get a carrot and just cut that baby, 
I can get a cucumber and I, I can even pop that one. <laughs> but when you're dealing with an animal, it becomes a little bit different, doesn't it? When you bring out that sentient creature and who's warm blooded, and uh, this at least is a, a little of an approximation of it. Uh, Gene, I know you're kind of childish, so I'm going to wiggle his tail here a little bit. So keep you, you know, uh, this is my chance. See, when I'm up here, I can go ahead and get everybody in here if I want to. Uh, but really think about it. A cucumber, a carrot, uh, a piece of plant, and certain things of food, as you know, were sacrificed, right? Uh, Cain offered the unauthorized thing, but he was offering, you know, a non-animal, non-blood uh, situation. But when you're dealing with one of these and you've been attached to it and had it for several weeks, and when you read scripture closely on this, I'm urging you to do that. Did those people ever have to lay their hands on the sacrifice when they gave it? Why? Did they have to keep it so many days? I'm challenging with this for you to read that. Did they have to have an animal for a while before they offered it as a sacrifice? Like maybe a week? Six, seven days? What? You see what the Bible says and check that out and you'll have a different perspective here that perhaps than perhaps that you've had you know, uh, before. But again, most of us can handle a cereal or a grain offering. Don't you figure you could handle that? <laughs> sure you could. Uh, so the question that we all ask ourselves is simply this. Why did God require man to use meek, guiltless, submissive animals for this repulsive and ugly, let's face it, that's what it is, unpleasant task of sacrifice to him as deity? Does, does he not care about an innocent animal? Uh, we know the sacrifices and offerings <coughs> excuse me, brought to Jehovah by the worshipers of, the, of that Old Testament dispensation were to express what? Their devotion, uh, of course their faith in an overall sense, their thanksgiving to God, and, and or to recognize, in other words, this need for personal forgiveness that they had, but why couldn't uh, and why didn't the omniscient God find another way or type of offering to be brought as the physical expression of their, and why couldn't they do that and bring something else as a, a physical expression of their inward devotion to deity, to God, to Jehovah? Well, uh, many people, of course, go wild on animal rights and so forth, and I mentioned some other things I've written in some of the other lectureships, uh, and we footnote that at least to let you, you know, uh, check that out. But uh, people who are the PETA persuasion, of course, will say that humans are equal in species. They're, we're a species. Uh, a lamb is a species. A goat is a certain type of species of an animal, dogs and cats. And, of course, they actually hold folks, like I've mentioned elsewhere, that you cannot use a sniffing type, sniff out type dog uh, to find drugs in somebody's car to be able to arrest them about that, uh, cocaine or whatever, heroin, it doesn't matter what it is, you, because see, you wouldn't put, uh, let's see, you mentioned grandma, and they say you shouldn't have set me off on that one, uh, but you wouldn't put your grandmother on a leash and take her there and let her sniff out the car that might have drugs, and you wouldn't take grandma on a leash and go to a building like in Oklahoma City that fell down, which might even have a little child that's still alive in that building that's fallen down now to find, sniff out and find a live or dead body of your own child. I don't believe the PD people would stay with that, do you? In fact, I'm confident. But it wouldn't matter whether they did or not. Jesus said, are ye of not more value than they? And that takes care of it right there. That's all you need. But there's all kinds, there's oodles, we could say, of scriptures that show that humans, as regarded by God, are here and all animals here. Does that mean we don't have some love and affection towards them? No, like I've already said, admitted that. But it's not an equation between the human species and any uh, mere creature uh, or animal. And yes, I touch on it, I'm not in this talk today, but you can read it for yourself, that some have actually uh, written books, what's called deep ecology and so forth, and, and it's stuff like, do, should trees, have plants, have, un, have standing? In other words, legal rights for natural objects like a tree or a plant. I had a botany professor, 
And he made the point, he said, the cell of an animal cell or a plant cell, he was a botanist of the plant situation, of course, and he said they're basically the same. And he had us, of course, looking at them, and then even, I think, a slide or two of an animal cell so you could compare them back and forth. And he says it's basically the same thing, uh, Terry, and telling us in a lab class there about it. And then he said, <coughs> he said the difference is, he said, he says that when you, you, know, you cut into the carrot or the cucumber or other things he named of a plant nature and into that kind of cell, he said the plants, he says, don't have a mouth in order to scream when you cut into it. <laughs> but this does. And I laughed. We all laughed at that. But really, it, it is true. God basically did the same type of an arrangement. And, they're, and plants are living. They can be living cells. But they are not like a sentient creature here that responds like these do and especially responding with blood with blood well again you can read some of that the atheist professor or philosopher Bertrand Russell uh, not only found fault with Christ in connection with the wicked destruction of the Gadarene swine or pigs there in Matthew 8 verses 28 through 34 but horror of horrors Bertrand Russell uh, found fault, you know, he found atrocious moral error, according to him, in the cursing by Jesus of the roadside fig tree. That's in Mark 11 or in Matthew 21. And due to stupidity, as I said, of the material and or disinterest in spiritual matters, Bertrand Russell therefore went on to point out, point, point uh, to put some other people known uh, to history above the Lord Jesus Christ. But, of course, we know, again, that from Scripture, that, uh, that is, is not right. Uh, uh, God saw fit through Christ to cast out demons and cast them out of humans because humans are still, as I've already said, up here, and swine are here, and cast those demons into those swine. And you remember, of course, uh, what uh, happened there. And, uh, and others, he cast the... Uh, demons out of, like in Mark 5, the demoniac from whom demons were cast out. Uh, what do you think he thought? Boy, he was a relieved and different, a changed person. Uh, and changed his behaviors, we often uh, point out. But <clears throat> before we criticize deity, we better remember how, uh, you know, God rebuked Israel's similar behavior, like in Ezekiel 18, uh, verse 29. And for Yahweh is of purer eyes than to behold evil, and thou canst not look uh, on perverseness. That's Habakkuk 1 in verse 13. As Moeller points out, uh, uh, once we knocked all species uh, off the our species, our species, human species, off the pedestal, it was only logical that we would come to see fauna, animals, and flora, plants, as entitled to rights. Uh, and so, you know, we end up euthanizing increasingly ready to euthanize the old, infanticize the young, and adamant about a right to abort unbo uh, unborn human beings. And, and now these people still will turn around after going along with that kind of foolishness and, uh, and atrocities uh, and now contend for the inherent dignity of plants. And no, no culture, we pointed out, can actually really recover uh, from that type uh, of mentality uh, at all. It just cannot... It just will not work uh, that way. Well, we know where all this started, don't we? The sacrifice and sacrificing uh, originated with Adam and Eve, but their man-made, a man-derived provision of loin cloths of leaves to cover themselves was inadequate. It was inadequate, while God's was sufficient. And I ask, isn't there a Christocentric principle here? And yes, there is. We're not sure how much they knew about how Genesis 3.15 would be fulfilled, but the fact is, uh, as far as the details of it, I don't know what they knew, but I know they were, of course, told uh, uh, this situation. Uh, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, God said. In other words, hostility, enmity. And between your seed, speaking to the devil, uh, your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Well, uh, we have a situation where animals had to die. Uh, whatever kind of animals uh, they, they were, we are not really told. But they had to die to be covered then concerning uh, sin. It was an inside type of situation, but they had to be covered with more of a clothing situation. Uh, according to God, what they had done was simply uh, in, you know, inadequate. 
And so it's a thing where uh, that I guess uh, in, I, I keep, I've always thought about Abel and how a keeper of sheep and so forth here, uh, whereas Cain, of course, a tiller of the soil or ground. Uh, but I thought about how did a Abel, did he feel like Vicky and I did about those 27 little pygmy goats and we didn't want someone to get them and, and so to speak, carve them up and, and draw blood? You haven't lived really, folks, until you have seen some of this and the blood, that life blood spurting out with each heartbeat. And then they just simply just melt away, kind of just crumple. I've seen they just simply crumple, you know, to the ground. Uh, well, the fact is, we, you know, we need to then uh, go back and think about these things and how did these Old Testament people, given their circumstances of what they had to meet and do about these animals, uh, was there any emotional uh, part to their being? How did it come out? Uh, and Abel, though knowing it was by true acceptable faith that he offered the animal, Hebrews 11 and verse 4, that we often cite, uh, how did he likely feel in killing and offering his helpless, live, young lambs? And of course, according to other scriptures like Genesis 4, 4, and the fat thereof, uh, uh, Abel's sacrifice, you see, recognized God's view of it and the just penalty for sin and his doing that with that little lamb here uh, and, and, and killing it. He recognized the just penalty for sin, folks, is death. And until you recognize that and see it, uh, then you're not even subject as far as really to go ahead and to scripturally, you're still amenable, but you're not uh, subject to baptism until you get that through your, your skull, until you understand it here. Uh, and, and to see what God is requiring and, and who is the, in charge of everything. And you have to recognize that it is not you or myself. Uh, it is God Almighty who sets forth how things are as far as reality is concerned. And we must think then God's reality type thoughts after him. And, and God, did God then have a provision in mind through the years? Some have already mentioned in this lectureship. Uh, and about the church and so forth. Was it in God's mind or is it something he had to dream up? Uh, did he have to dream up the, the situation even about Christ and what would happen in the centuries before Christ even came? Well, you see Noah in, in Genesis 8:20. He built an altar, you remember, and he took of every clean beast, of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings which also uh, is sort of a foreshadowing about the, the bird type things that could be offered when you're poor, as we see actually in the case of Christ. Uh, how could you have done that? How could you, I've thought a lot about it, how could you have done that and me thinking about those, any one of those 27 goats? And yes, we were more attached to some than we were others, but that's kind of like Jesus and the multitude, Jesus and the 70, Jesus and the 12 apostles or disciples, Jesus and the what? Three. And then was there one out of that who was the disciple whom Jesus loved? <laughs> yes, closer to him, don't you see? That's just natural. It's just a natural uh, thing. Uh, I had some people concerning the war question to say that we're supposed to love uh, people like not your wife. You're supposed to love these people whom you don't even know more so than your own family and that all you can do is just throw your body on your family when somebody's going to kill them, to murder them, to shoot them, and so forth. That simply won't work. It just does not uh, fit reality. And I think we really all, when you think about it a couple of minutes, you really know that. But anyway, we're told that, I was going to say, could you do that in a cold, rote, ritualistic way? Well, I suppose so if you can kind of distance yourself from the animal and just take it and just slit. But I find some real difficulty uh, with that. And I hope you're already thinking ahead of me and thinking about this table right down here. Have you thought about that? <laughs> Does it have any relationship to this? Have you really thought about it lately and studied it? Do we just go through uh, sort of in a cold, rote, ritualistic way? Can we in participation in the Lord's Supper even in the... Well, you know, it's like I said as a kid. Uh, my mother said I was sitting there and just very small, and they were passing the emblems for the Lord's Supper. And uh, she said, and like a lot of kids do, you know, I spoke up and said, let me have some. And she says, no, 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 you know, you, and, I, and I, I said, well, why? she said, no, why, well, why not? Uh, and I said, she says, you don't understand what it means. 
And I said, well, what does it mean? She's, of course, whispering to me, you know, as this is happening. And she said, she t explained to me that the, uh, gr the grape juice or fruit of the vine, she, I think she said, she said grape juice, I believe she told me later, that she told me, because you know, I don't remember it. But she said uh, that that represents Christ's blood and that the bread represents his body, and that, you know, on the cross or something like that. And I said, okay, let me have it. Is that what we want, the Lord's Supper? I don't think so. I think you want to think about it. And would you think more about your dog or your cat? And tears people have come to us, or we've been around them, and maybe ourselves, to take the animal, and how to, I've done it over the years, take them in, pay them the 5 or $10 to put that animal down. I didn't even want to be there. I made Vicky do it. <laughs> why? You get attached. That's why. And I think that's what we need to see, at least part of it, about uh, all of this. And so, uh, again, uh, the, the scripture actually says that uh, we're told that it was, it was a pleasing, sweet savor to God. Uh, in Genesis 8.21, with the importance of Noah's sacrifice there, the aroma not being the smell, of course, that it was a sweet savor to God, uh, coming through your nostrils, but rather what the smell represented. It represents the substitutionary atonement for sin. That's ex in Exodus. Look at also compare Exodus 29 verses 18 and tw verse 25 and Leviticus 1 verse 9 and verse 13. Same is true regarding the grain offering in Leviticus 2 verses 1 and 2. And these are to be viewed as types for Paul reveals Christ as the ultimate propitiation which literally means a covering, to cover. Walk in love, even as Christ, Ephesians 5, verse 2. Walk in love, even as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for an odor of a sweet smell. Now we've escalated it like I mentioned yesterday. Now it's stepped up, hasn't it? And not just the blood uh, of an animal dying in your stead for you. And they, uh, an Israelite surely had to, and was really required, to think about what he was doing here in killing this poor little guiltless innocent uh, animal here. And so again, remember Romans uh, 15 verse 4, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, that since these things were written aforetime for our learning, then what, what should the question be? a shadow of good things to come, and say, have you studied the Old Testament sacrifices uh, closely in relationship to your Savior and ask what they can teach you, these Old Testament sacrifices, about him, Christ, and his Father. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob followed Noah's sacrificial model in their offerings. So study, you know, uh, through that. And again, notice that Leviticus 17 and verse 11, I think, gives us a key here. Uh, when you think of the millions of animals, literally millions of these that have been sacrificed, oh, I'm talking about all of them, of course, goats included, not just a lamb like this, and, and birds, pigeons, and so all of the blood, and you totaled it up, how many gallons do you suppose uh, we would have? And there's a purpose in that. You can just read it and sort of just read over it and think, well, what's that to me? Well, that's what we're wanting, of course, all of us, including myself, to recognize and to see in a better fashion, perhaps, uh, now than we ever have uh, before. I think this lectureship can help us in all the various speeches uh, about this matter, not just, not just mine. When you think of the years of the Mosaic Law and the millions of animal sacrifices were made, and here's the reason, Leviticus 17, verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make, an ato make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement by reason of the life. And, and there it is, blood, a blood sacrifice obviously representing Jesus Christ as God's true and final lamp. Uh, we know we ask, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Genesis 18, 25. Uh, will our holy, Isaiah 6, 3, 1 Samuel 2, 2. Will our holy God dilute the seriousness of his commands by just forgiving a sin without penalty, which would compromise his own holiness? This says he will not do it. 
And all those Old Testament sacrifices, millions of gallons of blood uh, given, he will not do it. He will not do it, especially when you see this, when you think of the Lord's table and communion uh, with him. God will not dilute it. He will not water it down. Uh, and well, We were talking something with someone just the other day about how uh, you can be nearly anything and, and can get away with it even in our military. They mentioned the one, the deserter, you know, that left his post and so forth. We just barely give somebody a little slap on the wrist. The last one I think that was actually executed was during World War II, as far as I can remember the history of it. And we tend to water things down to dilute it, but God would not do that. That's why this, as a type or situation, foreshadowing uh, the New Testament, New Covenant antitype found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Substitutionary atonement for sin. And every time you read or think about this, as the Israelites were also, of course, obviously to do, they were to think about what, how, what sin cost. It cost the Son of God. We should immediately think those of us who are Christians now, of course, and seeing the antitype up close through, through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the rest of the New Testament. The Israelites were well aware of the submissive nature, overall at least, of sheep. Uh, and, but Jesus was the true uh, Lamb of God, John 129, as John said, who just quietly submitted and he did not try to defend himself once it was, he was set to go to Jerusalem and go to hang on that cross uh, for us. He was willingly led you know, to uh, his death and gave up his, his uh, existence there because he knew it would benefit those who would believe and obey him. Hebrews 5, of course, 8 and 9, and so many other uh, verses. Just say this, that if the Jews of Jesus' time, of Jesus day and time knew anything at all about sin, they knew that sin was an expensive business with a seemingly endless animal, uh, annual cycle of animal sacrifices. Uh, imagine killing an animal and then sprinkling blood all around the altar. And you had to do it mostly through the priesthood, but, but it was partially the person who brought the sacrifice. That brought it, brings it home to you, I think, to have to do that. And to repeatedly, over and over again, well, we don't have that kind of priest, do we? You're going to, you hear more already about that. And it's not a continual uh, thing. It was a one-time uh, situation. But uh, we, you know, we tend, people want to just turn around and make judgments like PETA and others out of philosophy instead of scripture to recognize what has actually uh, happened here. Let me just point out here, because I'm, I'm going to run out of time, I know, and that is uh, that Moses prophesied that none of uh, Jesus' bones would be broken. You remember that? Uh, if you turn with me, turn at least to uh, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 46. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 12 and verse 46. I just want to tie this in a little bit for you. And that you'll remember uh, Psalm 34:20 which is used by the psalmist David. And David uh, then said, He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. And, and we're going to read from John 19 in just a second to go with this. But in other words, David, uh, along about 1000 B.C., prophesied, because it is a prophecy, as I said yesterday, he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. But here's what Moses prophesies in effect. And that he prophesied in this type and typical type way uh, that none of Jesus' bones would be uh, broken. Uh, one version says in Exodus 12, 46, you shall not break any of its, what is it? You're going to hear more about it in a little bit, I think. But the Passover lamb's bones, don't, they're, not to be, they're not to be broken. The New King James says, in, in one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house nor shall you break one of its bones. Now think about that in relationship to this little lamb that I have here. And, and here's, a, here's a leg. I hope you can see it from back there. It's a little bit on the short side, but of course he's kind of young looking, I think. But you can't, you can't break that leg. You've got four legs. You not to break any of those legs. Well, what's, what's going on? What, what is that, what's that saying? Again, I've stressed the emotional part of it and about people and how to put their hand on the animal right before it is 
uh, sacrifice here and the priest takes over. And some of it, yes, was for preacher pay. That's what some people think it was, folks. That's all it was in the Old Testament was simply how priests ripped off all the Jews, all the people to take sacrifice. Well, that might have been going on uh, in other cultures for sure to make money, and that's all it was about. But, and maybe, of course, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, some like Eli's sons or somebody doing some of that kind of stuff. But it's wrong, and it's wrong now. If you're just preaching for money, I'd just say, well, quit. But what I really would say to you is repent. <laughs> repent and get right with God and get back on track. Track. We've got some that may be even listening to me now over the Internet that possibly are hearing it at some time, and they, they need to come back to the one faith, uh, to their one Lord, and not operate like they're doing. But notice in John chapter 19, it says this in verses, you could begin in verse 31, but I'm going to start at verse 32. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other, talked about the thieves who had been crucified with him. But when they came uh, to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, what does it say? They did not break his legs. They did not break his legs. Was that put in there as a sweet little nugget, I think? That's what I would call it, a sweet little nugget of truth. And if you can keep reading all these different things as we've already pointed out and not see the apologetic value in it, well, then you're in need of more help than some of us apparently can give to you. Because it's tucked in there, folks, and it was put in there. No, no Christian went back and inserted this kind of stuff into a Jewish document. I don't, I don't think so. Uh, back there, uh, you shall not break any of it, the Passover lamb's bones in Exodus 12, verse uh, 46. It didn't happen. They did not break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. And he who saw it has borne witness, his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. These things took place, why? So that the scripture might be uh, fulfilled. God thought so much of us that he had uh, Jesus to come and to die, and Jesus was willing to submit himself and to do uh, that uh, very thing. Again, he was cut off, Isaiah 53. Think of just reading Isaiah 53. I hope you'll read it before you go to bed tonight. But he was cut off, this is verse 8 of Isaiah 53, he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And that's what all of this was about. And I did, yes, deliberately... I knew Michael would want me to show some blood here today, so we brought this. But do you see it, Michael? There it is. So that's about the best I could do. I wanted to go out and just put it on the Lord's table. So <clears throat> look at the little, the little animal in that uh, black and white picture. In fact, you can put it in your Bible somewhere. It's probably what some of us will do. <coughs> Excuse me. And think about these sacrifices and what they represent. And again, God is approaching us and doing the things necessary for our salvation. And the, I've described some of the different kinds of offerings. I didn't get to that today, but I hope you'll just sit down uh, again over in a corner somewhere, you know, where your wife has put you just like Vicki, as I said, does me, and just sit there and read through this of these different kinds of sacrifices and meditate on that in relationship to the blood, obviously, of Jesus Christ, which is so much more crucial uh, for our sins being uh, remitted. Remember that song, Jesus paid it all. I can't even read it. <laughs> all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it, what, Michael? As white as snow. There it is. I hope you'll study it more. Sorry, I'm losing it here, but... It's emotional. If it's not to you, brother or sister, there's something wrong, and you need to do something and to repent. I could go right into an invitation, but I won't. <laughs> Thank you. We do appreciate that. It is, uh, should be emotional to us. Uh, we... We shy away from emotionalism as we should, 
but there's a proper emotion to be shown. That's right. But um, you, know, you mentioned PETA. What, what was that? Uh, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Well, I was always for them until now. I thought that was people eating tasty animals. Yes, oh, that's right. There you go. That's right. I, I was always supportive of that. <laughs> I have some buttons that do say that. Uh-huh. <laughs> As you were talking about the Lord's Supper, and you won. I always, I, I, I told my parents, I want to eat too. Uh, <laughs> I just thought it was a meal, you know, uh, growing up. Yeah, there's an understanding that needs to be taken. Um, and until we're ready for those that understanding, there's not a proper worship that we can engage in. Well, we do appreciate the excellent lesson. There's a whole lot more material in the book.